Hey, sophomores. It's that time again. It's almost Christmas. We've came through July the 4th, Labor Day. Kate Uton, we've came come through the pumpkin spice season. <laughs> you can laugh about that with your mom and dad. Then we went to Halloween. Now it's time for Thanksgiving and Christmas. So you know what that means. Oh, look. You better watch out. You better not cry, you better not pout, I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town, he's making a list, he's checking it twice, he's gonna find out who's been naughty or nice. Santa Claus is coming to town he sees you when you're sleeping he knows when you're awake he knows if you've been bad or good so be good for goodness sake oh you better watch out you better not cry you better not pout I'm telling you why Santa Claus is coming to town. Well, that should have got you up out of bed there and ready to watch this video. Well, it's time for our lesson two notes of unit two, the one about the pilgrims. So I know you're wondering why in the world, if you're going to talk about the pilgrims, why in the world do you have a Santa Claus hat on? Well, let's take a look. Get out your notebooks. Here we go. While you're getting out your notebooks, let me activate to you and tell you about my best Christmas present ever. I want you to actually think about it. And you got to, excuse me, a little Charlie Brown Christmas tree drawing there. When I was about a nine-year-old kid, my mama Phyllis, love her heart, gave me a Christmas present. Now, some of you ladies out here might not understand this, but for you guys who are a big Star Wars fan, she got me the Millennium Falcon spaceship toy. I got a picture of it right there. Boy, that's almost like the one I used to have. Let me tell you something. It was the best Christmas present I ever got. I mean, I opened that thing up and I had joy in my heart. And I could play with that Millennium Falcon Star Wars spaceship. And it was big enough to where you could even open it up. And I had all the action figures, you know, and I could put them in there. It was the best Christmas present ever. Mama, Phyllis, bless your heart, rest your soul. That was the greatest Christmas present I think I ever got. Hmm. So what about you? I want you to think a little bit. Christmas, what has been the best Christmas present you ever opened? Hmm. I know you're all thinking about that right now. So that's the question out there. What was it? Peyton Clark, what was the best Christmas present you ever got? What about you, Kate and McClure? I don't know. I think what we should do is, I think I can give you some bonus points if you guys will email me on Schoology and just tell me about the best Christmas present you ever got. You got that, Ethan Graham? Email me on Schoology. Anybody that emails me on Schoology and tells me about the best Christmas present they ever had, I can put in maybe three bonus points for you in class because I want to know about it. See, I don't have you here at school with me. I can't go around the room. See, look, my, room, my seats are empty. Y'all aren't here. And I miss all of y'all. Except for Cassidy White, she talks a lot. <laughs> ah, I got you. And I miss all of y'all. I can't go around the room and talk about that. So I just am going to have to just rely on you to email me on Schoology about the best Christmas present you ever opened. Mine was that Millennium Falcon. Man, what the, that was the best Christmas present ever. Now, your brain is already gone. You're activated now. So let's talk a minute. You know what Christmas is? You know what Thanksgiving is? These, these are uh, religious holidays. So how important is religion to you? 
For some families out there, your religion is very important. For other families, maybe the religion isn't something that's as important to you. Hopefully it is. And thankfully, we live in a country where freedom of religion is allowed and encouraged. But Christmas is a religious holiday where we celebrate the birth of baby Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And it's important to us because of our religion. So, that's how I was activating you today. Sang you a Christmas song, talked about the best Christmas present. Christmas is a religious holiday. Hmm. I'm going to take off the Christmas hat now. We learned about Jamestown. Yeah, it was a business venture. Remember? Remember this. Why were people in, in England interested in founding Jamestown? Simple. Two reasons. Money and land. It was a business venture. But you know, the next colony that was founded in America by English people was not a business venture as such, but it was founded because of religion. And we all know about those people because we're coming up on Thanksgiving. Those people were the pilgrims. So get out your notebook. Here we go with a few notes. The next colony that we have that we're going to learn about that was established were the pilgrims. We learned about Jamestown in the last unit. Now we're going to learn about the pilgrims. And I have EQ number four up. Remember to pause this screen at any time so you can copy down these notes. Remember to take good notes. Why did the pilgrims come to the new world? We know why Jamestown was founded. For money and land. Business. What about the pilgrims? Well, they came over here for two reasons, too. They came over to practice their religion freely. So they came over here for religious freedom. And they came over to escape persecution. I can explain that in a moment, but first of all, I think it's really cool that I put a pilgrim hat right there. Never understood why they wear their belt buckles on their hats. I guess it was keep their hat from falling off. Not real sure. Pilgrims, we have to go way back. They came over to, for religious freedom and to escape persecution. I'm sure that you guys learned in world history class about the very famous... Martin Luther, the German monk, who wrote his famous 95 theses, not theses, but theses, his arguments against the Catholic Church, and he posted them on the Catholic Church door on Halloween evening back in the 1500s somewhere. But this started a movement against the Catholic Church. There were some people that in Europe that didn't like some of the practices the Catholic Church was doing. Now, I have to stop and pause a moment and say to you that, you know, the Catholic Church today in America, or in the world even, it's not the, the Catholic Church of the Middle Ages. It, it's really different. So, I mean, there's, I mean, you know, the Catholic Church during the Middle Ages had a lot of corruption things going on in it. And... You know, I know a lot of people today who are practicing Catholics and are, you know, wonderful, wonderful people. And I'm, I don't want you to think that, you know, anybody who's a Catholic today, it's, it's, it's just not the same. But the Catholic Church in medieval times, did, did, they did practice some things that were a little bit questionable and unethical, but you couldn't say anything or you were brought in front of the Spanish Inquisition, in front of the church, and you could be put in jail or tortured for it. So, you know, you, you couldn't speak out against the church. Um, one of the things I always laugh about, uh, the Catholic Church, that, that they did, they sold indulgences. And indulgences were like, a way for you to pay the church so that you could get your sins forgiven. So, yeah, get to, you know, try to wrap your mind around that for a minute. You know, you paid money to get your sins forgiven, and the church took the money and gave a couple of uh, Holy Mother Marys, and your sins were forgiven magically, and they took your money. Um, <laughs> you know, today, that don't sound right, does it? I mean, let's take, uh, I don't, I mean, let's take Layla Tompkins, for example. Layla, you know, your, your birthday's coming up. You know you're going to have a wild weekend, and you're going to party. So 
maybe, you know, you just uh, probably did a lot of bad things maybe on your birthday. So you go into the church the next week and say, uh, you know, hey, I messed up. Here's 50 bucks. <laughs> and the church would say, Layla, your sins are forgiven. Uh, I mean, the whole concept just doesn't sound right, does it, Layla? That we pay for forgiveness of sins. It's, you know, for someone, you know, for a country that's based on Christianity, you know, we know only God can do that. But these were things that were going on in the Middle Ages, Roman Catholic. They, they even did, they even did pre-sale indulgences. Yeah, 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 pre-sale. Like, if you knew you were going to mess up, you could just go ahead and pay the money up front and, and be forgiven before it even happened. So, <laughs> so yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's right, Maddie Campbell. You could just walk into the church and say, I'm, I'm going out this weekend, and it's going to be a rough weekend. Here's 50 bucks beforehand, and you can get your sins forgiven. And uh, we all kind of know that all of that is kind of just ludicrous, really. Well, Martin Luther, the German monk, was one of the first people to speak out against practices like this that were very questionable about the church. Um, you know, he, he, he even had a few radical ideas, like he wanted to translate the Bible from Latin into German so people could read, so that they could read the Bible for themselves in their own language and try to understand it, rather than to have a Catholic priest, who usually was the only one who knew Latin, read it to them and then tell them what it said because how would you know if they were telling you the truth or not? But anyway, Martin Luther started the whole, and John Calvin and others started the, the whole Protestant Reformation. And what that meant was Protestant, root word, protest. Reformation, root word, word reform, change. It, were, it was people who were speaking out against changes that needed to be made in the church. And the Protestant Reformation caused a division in Europe. You became a Protestant, or you remained a Catholic. Uh, and Protestants kind of separated themselves from the Roman Catholic Church and went on their way. Well, now, th since this is American history and we came from England, so, you know, this is what England did. You know, England became a Protestant, but the Church of England broke off from the Catholic Church and, and England formed their own church. But guess who was in charge of that? You know, the, the Roman Catholic Church has traditionally, even in the Middle Ages and, and even today, you know, you guys know who's in charge of the Catholic Church. That's right, the Pope. Well, the King of England didn't like this. You know, he was the King of England, but everyone was Catholic, and in charge of the Catholic Church was the Pope. So in many ways, the Pope was even above the kings. So this was the king's chance during the Protestant Reformation, I would assume. You know, they broke away from the Catholic Church. He formed his own church, church in England. It was called the Anglican Church of England. And guess who was in charge of that? Not the Pope, the king. That's right, he put himself in charge of that church. And then that way, he could dictate what went on in the Anglican Church because it was the Church of England and he was the King of England. Well, as the years went on, there were people in England who didn't like the practices of the Anglican Church. But if you spoke out against that, it was like speaking out against the king and you would suffer persecution for it. So we're going to talk about the Puritans and things like that here in a moment, but the Pilgrims were basically a group of people who didn't like the way the Church of England was doing things. They wanted to, you know, practice their religion, religion a little differently and do things differently. But they were suffering persecution from that. So they actually, the pilgrims actually left England and went over to uh, uh, the Netherlands, stayed where the Dutch was. And, and they tried to live there a while. And, but then they felt like that uh, their, their children were being indoctrinated with that culture. So they decided they needed a fresh start. And this group of people, known as that we know of today as the Pilgrims, they journeyed to the New World and founded a colony in the New World. And they did so because of EQ number four. You know why. Two reasons. They wanted to be able to practice their, religious, their religion freely. And they wanted to escape the persecution that they were getting back in England. Because you couldn't speak out against the king. 
Now, I put a little timeline here for us just so us we can get an idea. In 1492 was when Columbus sailed the ocean blue. So that's when he first discovered the, the New World. But it took over 100 years later for Jamestown to be established by Virginia, or Jamestown to be established by, by the, uh, the company in England. It was in Virginia, modern day Virginia. And I put dollar signs there because it was a business venture. And now in 1620, the Pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock. And hopefully you know where that's at, but it's in modern day Massachusetts, a lot farther north than Virginia. And it was not founded as a business venture, but for religious freedom and to escape persecution. So just a little short timeline there for you. Now, EQ number five asks us to describe life in a pilgrim colony. Family was incredibly important to these pilgrims. In fact, if, if there was an orphan, uh, uh, another family adopted them very quickly, took them in and raised them as if they were their own. Uh, family was very important. They wanted to pass their religious ideas down to their kids and their kids' kids. Uh, I mean, face it, you know, if you had a religion where you didn't have family, you didn't have children, your religion would eventually die out with you. But with family, you pass your religion down to the next generation and it keeps going. Family was very important to the pilgrims. Religion, of course, was the center and the whole purpose for education. Uh, for the pilgrims, there was only one reason to learn how to read, and that was so you could read the Bible. And of course, they used the Bible as a textbook. And of course, they had this little thing called the New England Primer. It looks like primer, but we call it a primer. It's a little book. And it was a book full of Bible stories and kind of Bible rhymes, uh, kind of like uh, when you were a kid, you had uh, Mother Goose's uh, book of nursery rhymes. You know, Georgie Porgy, pudding and pie, kissed the girls and made them cry. You know, that kind of stuff. Jack be nimble, Jack be quick, Jack jump over the candlestick. Well, the New England Primer had these little rhymes in it, but they were made up of Bible stories rather than just, you know, nursery rhyme characters. They were rhymes about stories from the Bible. So family was important. Religion was the center and purpose for their education. And women rocked. Women, I put women power there. All right, you women, you can be proud. But women were the glue that held this colony together. And of course, you know, I got a picture here of pilgrims that I looked up online. There's the woman, she's the one in the middle. They got Indians, Native Americans, children there, the pilgrim men. But women were the glue that held this colony together. They were the ones in charge of the cooking. They were the ones in charge of, of uh, educating the children and teaching them. Uh, the, the women were in charge of, of basically everything that the men probably were lazy and doulas at. The women took care of it all women power, women were the glue that held this colony together. So that is life in the Pilgrim Colony, EQ number five. Now let's get down to some vocabulary words. Now, we'll take them two at a time. A sect. A sect is a religious group, small religious group. And immigrants are people that I need to shrink this a little bit, are people that move from one country and go live in another. A sect. Religious group, immigrants, people that leave one country and move to another. So here's my question to you. Were the pilgrims, were the pilgrims a sect? Yes, they were a small religious group. Were the pilgrims immigrants? Did they leave their country and move somewhere else? Hmm. Yes, they were. Now let's look at the other ones. Vocabulary word number 10, Puritans. Now the Puritans were people in England who wanted to purify or make changes to the Anglican Church, the Church of England. These were people who thought that the Anglican Church of England needed to do things a little differently. And these people who wanted to reform the Anglican Church were known as Puritans because they wanted to purify, therefore the name Puritans. So, quick question, were the pilgrims a sect? Hmm. 
Yes. Were the pilgrims immigrants? Yes, they, they, they immigrated. Were the pilgrims Puritans? Yes. They lived in England and wanted to change things about the Anglican Church, but because of being, but then they were persecuted for that. Let's take a look at the next one. The next word, separatist. I go back now to my Star Wars ties and my Millennium Falcon. Star Wars, the separatist. People who wanted to separate away from the empire. People who didn't like what the Galactic Empire was doing. So the separatists, you know, in this time were people who wanted to separate themselves from the Church of England. They wanted to cut all ties with the Church and get away from it to form their own religious group. Uh, that, those were the separatists. They wanted to separate, cut ties from the Church of England. Things about that church that they didn't agree with. So were the pilgrims Puritans? Yes. Were the Pilgrim Separatists? Yeah. They cut all ties away from the Church of England and left. Now the next word is number 12, Pilgrims, a religious group of people who left Europe and came to the New World for religious freedom. So the Pilgrims were all of these above. Were the Pilgrims a sect? Yes. Were they immigrants? Yes. Were they Puritans? Yes. Were the Pilgrims Separatists? Yes. Were the Pilgrims Pilgrims? Hmm. Well, that sounds kind of funny, but yes. <laughs> and the last vocabulary, or the next to last vocabulary word, William Bradford. Just like Captain John Smith was the leader of the Jamestown colony, William Bradford was the leader of the Pilgrim colony. The one that made the, brand, the brave, it was a brave choice to leave the Netherlands and the Dutch and move over to a brand new world and found their own colony. They were a little more prepared than Jamestown. But it was still a rough go at the beginning. Now, we've all heard of the ship that they landed. The pilgrims came over on the Mayflower. We know they landed at Plymouth Rock. Um, but at any rate, the Mayflower Compact, I know when you see compact, we have it has a different word today, but... Basically, back then, that meant an agreement, a contract. So think of compact, contract. The Mayflower Compact. On the way over, across the ocean, the pilgrims were on this boat, the Mayflower, and the men sat down, and they created an agreement about how they were going to govern this new colony that they were going to live in. They were, you know, they were leaving England. They were not going to be governed by the king, so to speak. So they had to figure out a way to govern themselves. And it was, became known, and all the men signed it and agreed to it. William Bradford was there. And this became known as the Mayflower Compact. And it was the first attempt that we see at self-government in the British colonies. And why is that important? Because later on, when the colonies break away from Great Britain and we become the United States of America, of course... We are going to go back and look at things like the Mayflower Compact and even the Magna Carta, you know, and we're going to look at those old things from history to form the Constitution that we created in 1787, and it was about self-government. How is our country going to govern itself? Well, how are the pilgrims going to govern their colony? The Mayflower Compact. Now, I have a picture right there of a makeup compact. And you say, why in the world do you have that on there? Well, it's a trick. You know, you girls use those little makeup compacts, you know, that open up and you put your face on in the mornings with it. Put your eyeliner on. I wore eyeliner once. It's called guy liner when guys wear it. It's guy liner. I actually made a, I actually made a bet with my class that they all couldn't make an A on the test. And the bet was if they all made an A on the test, then I would have to wear guy liner for a day, all day at school. So I made the bet. That, that bunch of kids studied. They all made A's. And the next day at school, by, as soon as I had all them tests graded, the girls had the guy liner ready for me. So when I got to school that morning, you know, they took their guy liner and, and they outlined my eyes and all of that. I, I really don't know anything about that stuff, ladies, but... And I had to walk around all day at school with guy liner on. 
<laughs> I lost a bet. I guess I shouldn't make bets like that anymore. Oh, well. But at any rate, just here, here now listen to my trick because, uh, you know, I'm like the cat in a the hat. There's all kinds of tricks I know. So here's a trick. You know, just like a makeup compact is your first attempt to put your face on in the morning, ladies, the Mayflower Compact was the first attempt at self-government in the colonies. So that's a little trick I have to always remember that. Just like a makeup compact is your first attempt, ladies, to put your face on in the mornings, the Mayflower Compact was the first attempt at self-government in the British colonies that we see. So that's just a little trick. Oh well. Now we go down to the last word. The Pilgrims came across a very important and unique character in history, and that's Squanto. Now, in this unit, we're going to be doing a worksheet about Squanto where you're going to read about his life and all of the horrible things that poor Squanto went through. And I love the worksheet and I love that reading about him because it gives you a little insight into this great Indian's life who's a famous part of our history. But for now, in our notes, until we get to that worksheet later, but for now, he's an Indian who befriended and helped out the pilgrims when they came. Uh, you'll find out he basically was an orphaned Indian who had no tribe. But uh, he kind of befriended and attached himself to the pilgrims and helped them survive, helped that colony, that first colony of pilgrims to survive. And that's who Squanto was and we'll learn more about him in a worksheet coming up. Well, that finishes this section of notes. I would like to show you guys something, all of my sophomores. Let's take a look over here. I don't want you to forget about this. I don't know when I'm gonna to get to see y'all again. And of course, all of my seats are empty. They're just empty, you know? Sad. Right there's Talon Shockey's seat. You're not there, Talon. Oh well, you'll be back soon, I hope. But I don't want y'all to forget about our leaderboards here. In uh, fifth period, our superhero division. You can see all of our points, and it looks like the Brazilian spider team is clinging to a one-point lead over the spider bats. So I think the spider bats are River's team. All right, River, you, you and Cody Harrell, y'all are going to get this together and catch them. And then over here in sixth period, uh, our food division, we have on this side, we have the rib steaks winning. That's, uh, I'm trying to think, that's uh, Trey Lee. Uh, yeah, that's Trey's team, the rib steaks. They're winning our competition. And on this side, the meat lovers pizza and the cheesy crab wings are all tied up at 22. So I just wanted to show you all that. So the next time that we're back in class, we're probably going to do a review game from the notes that you just took, hopefully, on the pilgrims. So there'll be questions because there's always a question. And you'll have to come up in front of class and answer a question and perform some kind of crazy activity and some crazy game and we'll keep team points going as long as we can. So hopefully we'll get y'all guys back here at the beginning of December. Until then, <coughs> don't forget, if you want a few bonus points, Email me uh, on Schoology about the best Christmas present ever. And I'll be looking forward to seeing that. Until then, this is Coach Eads signing out. <laughs>